This is our third panel of this uh, series of panel for body politics project, including the exhibition at Spielman and Blackwell Gallery and their lovely directors are actually sitting on the front, Amy um, Blackwell and Leslie Spielman. They support us a, a lot in this process. I would also uh, want to thank you Contemporary Art Center to support us and a partner with this project. And um, I would also thank uh, two foundations, Persian Heritage Foundation, Fine Foundation, and uh, Ironica Foundation to help us and give us grant to let this amazing event uh, happening. I just want to shortly say our mission to have this exhibition, our main mission was uh, introducing um, our legend artist, Ardeshi Mohasses in South of America, which is uh, amazing. And also I forgot to uh, thank you, Loyola University, and I just saw Dr. Boyesdan <laughs> sitting there. Thank you. Without uh, Loyola's support, it didn't happen. Um, and now I would like to introduce our uh, dear moderator because she's going to introduce everybody and I thought it's not fair, no one introduced her. Uh, Dr. Uh, Leila Diba is an independent art advisor, a scholar and curator specializing in the art of 19th and 20th century Iran. She has been the director and chief curator of the Negaristan Museum uh, of 18th and 19th century Iranian art in Tehran from 1975 to 78, and the Brooklyn Museum of Arts Curator of Islamic Art from 1990s to 2000, where she organized the exhibition Royal Persian Paintings, the Qajar Epoch, 1785 to 1925. Dr. Diba has also collaborated with the Guggenheim Abu Zabi Museum and Asia Society Museum in New York and sits on the boards of the uh, Sada War Memorial Foundation and of the National Museum of Asian Art, Charles Lang Freer and Arthur M. Sackler Galleries, Washington. Current projects include the publication of Art in Peril, the case of the Negarista Museum and its collections of 18th and 19th century Iranian art and the invasion of the modern Iranian landscape, Kamal ul -Mulk, uh, paintings of Mazandaran. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diba, and I would like, oh, I, I just saw Dr. Moazani is here, and wanted to thank Dr. Moazami uh, that everything is happening uh, in this exhibition and the event we are just, uh, he initiated. So thank you. And I would like to give the floor to Dr. Diba. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome everyone, and we're delighted to be live in New Orleans celebrating the work of Adeshir Mohasses. Uh, I wish to thank the Mohasses Trust uh, for their uh, tremendous efforts and perseverance in organizing this project, and to thank Sara Madanda, uh, the cur curator and organizer. Uh, our panel tonight is a two-part panel. Uh, Adeshi Mohasses in museums and Adeshi Mohasses in books. So um, I will address a few remarks um, and then introduce the speakers. The topic of Mohasses in museums is part of a larger conversation taking place about the presentation and preservation of non Western art in, in Western museums. And it is a large, uh, a very large, uh, important conversation about how to integrate and to what extent I is um, non-Western art can be integrate, integrated into the history of uh, global modernism and into the canon of um, a modern world art. Um, there are very few examples of Mohasses' work in any museum. 
Walker, uh, th there are no works apparently in Iran, public institutions, and uh, here in America, we're fortunate um, that there are uh, works in the um, uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, in the uh, National Museum um, of Asian Art at the Freer, um, in the Library of Congress, uh, Mohasesa's first major body of work, Life in Iran, was produced um, for the Library of Congress and is held there. And um, outside of America, the British Museum um, has a few of his works, or at least uh, one or two. So you can see it's really a, a very small scattering. And the role of private collectors and institutions in preserving and presenting his work is, is essential. Um, so it's also a question of visibility. Once the works are acquired, what, what happens to them? And in this context, I would briefly discuss the art, which acquired about five works of Iranian modernists in the early 1960s and didn't show them for like 40 years. So uh, that was a great opportunity that was missed. And when we did Iran Modern, luckily we were able to borrow a few of their works. But it was an example of how even if, a, if an institution collects um, non-Western or Middle Eastern modernism, they may never show it. And that's not the case at the Met, thanks to our curator who is with here tonight. So I think this panel is, is very significant. Um, before moving on, I would say a, a few personal notes about my interactions with the artist. Um, my first interaction was thanks to Nikki Nujumi and Shirin Nishat, who were organizing the first major exhibition of Mohasesa's work at the Asia Society Museum in New York in 2008. And um, we had a meeting in which we talked about the project and the works they were acquiring. And I, I'm sure Nikki remembers it differently, but all of a sudden I said, wait a minute, I think I have a work of his. And I, I went uh, into uh, uh, my storage and I came out with a work. And um, Nikki and Shireen were incredibly excited uh, to see this work. They told me they, it had disappeared and they had been looking for this. Um, and it, it was such an important work, uh, they decided to put it on the cover of, of their catalog. And it was an amazing, I think, moment because the work had actually been acquired by my late husband who uh, had gone to, to visit Adishir. Um, some friend or colleague had brought him and, and he had bought this work which was an image of a poet with his amputated legs and um, so that, that was my first interaction, which brought together my late husband and my dear friends and, and uh, this amazing moment. Um, afterwards, um, I was working um, with the uh, Heller Gallery and we went down and visited uh, this year and we were, I think, very blessed, very fortunate to have, uh, to, s to see him in his studio um, he was not well, but you could feel the creative force and the passion that was still animating him in spite of his illnesses. And he, um, he lived in the uh, West Village, uh, very small quarters with a, he had a 24 hour nurse who was taking care of him. And it was, it was very moving that um, we had that interaction for a brief time. And again, when um, I was working, I was co-curating a show called Iran Modern at Asia Society, uh, which opened in 2014. And Adashir was on the short list of the artists that we were uh, going to have to select out of, out of all the great Iranian modern artists. We had to select 26 or 27, I think. In Hello? Uh, ag again, I, I had a, another interaction. 
So I've had my moments with, with Ardish here, and I'm delighted uh, to be here tonight um, to celebrate his work and to um, help moderate this panel. And um, I just, um, again, the Asia Society Museum project, um, Asia Society was, was not collecting Iranian modern art. So um, it, it did not result in any additions to their permanent collection. The exhibition came and went. That's not the case um, with our first speaker, uh, Claire Davies, who is Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And Claire um, has been a leading light in um, promoting um, and educating uh, the American public uh, about Iranian modern art and, and Middle Eastern art in general. Uh, she curated the seminal um, Sia Amajani show and um, ha has worked on the installation of Ardashir's work in the, in the permanent galleries and most recently uh, uh, curated uh, Louise Bourgeois her early paintings work, which is on view here in New Orleans by amazing coincidence. So um, I would like to pass the mic now to Claire and ask her to give us her presentation on Ardashir and the Met. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, uh, I would mention how um, grateful I am to you as well in uh, being a resource to many people, I think, on this topic, um, the broader topic of Iranian contemporary and modern art. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Behruz Moazemi and uh, Sarah Ma Maadandar. <laughs> Maadandar. Um, so this evening I, I have 20 minutes to talk about um, the collection of works by Ardashir that are at at the Met, um, put that in a little bit of a context of the Met itself and its um, curatorial and acquisitions program as it's being reimagined today. Um, and also think about how, think, think from perhaps the curator's perspective of how, how do you display this work in a museum like the Met in a way that gives it context, enriches the viewer's experience. Um, I think there's, there's often a lot of questions that arise and potential pitfalls when you're showing non-Western modern contemporary artists in Western museums. So it's a question that deserves, I think, careful and sustained thought. Um, I would just begin with uh, the, I'll begin at the beginning with a couple of the works. There are three works that entered the museum um, in 2012, 2014, um, by Ardashir, coming from the um, Ardashir Mohasses Trust, uh, acquired by my colleagues in the Islamic Art Department, um, including Mariam Akhtiar, uh, who's also a big supporter of him. So these works, and I think we can move to the next one as well, uh, are very much in keeping with the, I think, the exhibition that's on view currently around the corner. Um, so this is a moment, a slightly later moment in his life in the 90s and has a pretty distinct sort of aesthetic. Um, and so I'm grateful to my colleagues in Islamic art for sort of laying down the foundation stones. Uh, once I arrived in 2015 at the Met, um, I was extremely lucky to um, eventually come across um, a number of patrons of the arts who were very keen on um, supporting uh, his work and wanted to gift a lot of his works to the Met. So I was, I greeted that <laughs> proposal with open arms. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about what we have there. Um, actually, could we go back one slide? So. <clears throat> we have about 20 loose um, works on paper by Ardashir. This is a special one because it's from 1951 when the artist was at the ripe old age of 13, already publishing in um, 
of the you know media of the day and working in a somewhat satirical vein you can see and what's interesting about this piece as well is I mean what I see and and really what this presentation is about is um, is a call for um, scholars and people who are interested in Mohasis to come access this uh, collection and and help us build the knowledge uh, around it but so this, what I do think is interesting about this piece, which seems to show this, you know, uh, peasant figure, and he's maybe singing, and the cats in the back are all <laughs> um, in pain from the noise. But there's also this blank space, and I imagine that that's where there would have been some sort of commentary or text um, involved, and the relationship between text and image in Mohasis's work I think is quite an important one and an interesting one. But um, as this image shows, he was a working professional artist from a very, very young age. Um, we could go to the next one. So this is just another example, I think, of uh, one of the pieces in the, in, in the exhibition. It's, as you can see, he does not shy away from issues of violence, um, hierarchies of power, oppression, um, and often does so in a, it's almost in a quasi, there are moments of sort of surrealist um, embodiment of that kind of violence in the work. And maybe we could go to the next one. A uh, slightly dif uh, different kind of approach. And one thing that struck me looking through the works is uh, how many different sort of identities he can express and approaches to, um, to the work he has. And also media, different media. I think in this period he was working with watercolor, um, sometimes with crayon, um, you, certainly pencil, as well as ink, which is what he's best known for. Okay. So this is a piece from 1988, and I think if any of you caught this morning's panel, which was really interesting, there was some discussion about how he would lean on historical, this sort of very rich visual history of Persian Iranian culture to inform his own works and to produce images that were um, able to slip past censorship because they present, they use the language of an earlier era, a visual language of an earlier era, and the sort of references to different periods in Iranian history to speak about the present. And it's interesting that in the 80s, and you know, after the revolution, I think you start to see figures, whereas before the Shah may have been the sort of coded figure behind the scene, you start to see more images of um, men who look like the religious leadership that was taking over the country. And uh, here he's combined with the image of the Shah's crown, which is a pretty, pretty direct kind of acknowledgement of how that transfer of power has happened. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorites. I just, I love these series of figures he does, um, especially of women. And, uh, you know, I, as I said before, there's, I'm, I'm not uh, even going to attempt to give you a full reading of these works. They need lots of careful study and um, hopefully some ambitious young graduate students or, you know, senior scholars who would like to take this on. Uh, so, the conversation I think about Ardashir's par partly, you know, there's this, I, I feel like there's somewhat of a false binary of is this satire or is this art? And um, of course, satire in a European tradition has a very, there's a very strong visual artistic lineage of, you know, sort of satirical work in a Western tradition. Um, which he was certainly looking at, very interested in. But he was also interested in, um, I think, 
a history of literary satire from the region, and you can see him combining those two at different moments. Um, so who do we, how do we contextualize someone like this? He came to New York in 1976, just before the revolution, um, under, I think, some pressure from the political nature of his work. Um, and he was part of uh, an art, you know, an art scene and a scene of, um, you know, illustrators and others. I know that Sal Steinberg was somebody that he was really interested in. Um, and so, you know, this is one, one place that Mohasis lives. He lives in many, I come to learn. Um, I think some of the discussion this morning I was reflecting on and it felt like there was a, a sort of a need to, you know, do, do we call this satire or do we call it art? And for me, they, these two things are not mutually exclusive at all. And it, he, I think, you know, he also, his work is really resonant for me with um, works by, of the Neue Sachlichkeit movement in Germany in the interwar period, where you have these very biting critique, critical, you know, um, scenes of Germany um, and that time of war veterans, um, how they're deformed, the sort of, um, the violence that had warped the society at that time, but also done in a way that's almost just visually incredibly captivating and, and rich. So I, you know, I might, I might put uh, Ardashir in, <laughs> in closer to them in a way in that they, you know, these are artists who also work in a satirical vein. Um, the other place we could put him is in um, the, you know, the midst of the artists who are working around him at the time in pre-revolutionary Iran. And I'm very proud to say that the Met is growing um, a strong collection of these often very hard to find works. Um, I'm certainly not suggesting that he, you know, that we can easily compare or say that these artists are doing the same thing as him. I don't think that that's the case. But it is a form of, it is a one way in which he can be contextualized. You know, there, there was this booming scene of artists who were doing really new and exciting things, and I think he was a part of that as well. Um, okay. Side. I'm also happy to say that we've been collecting works um, by living, or until very recently, living artists. Um, we have a piece by Nikki Najumi, one of two, and Shireen Nashad, Sia Armijani. So there's, I think he, I'm not saying he speaks to these artists specifically, but he's also part of the conversation as it moves forward. I don't think he has become any less relevant today. <clears throat> um, so what do we have of his? In addition to the 20 um, sort of single uh, sheets, works on paper, we have two series. One is um, titled West Struckness. It's a illustration of, that he did in the 80s for a book um, that was published in 1961, I believe, uh, by Jalal Ali Ahmed. And um, this was a very important uh, publication. It questioned, you know, the, it questioned the way in which the modernization of Iran has, was happening under the Shah. Uh, he was critical of how technology was being absorbed so quickly of know, what was being lost. It, and um, so Ardashir did this series of 12 drawings um, to illustrate that. And this, these, these were published in the book later. So um, I don't know. These are all 12 of them. Uh, soon I hope, to hope, I hope to have them up on the MET website so that this is all visible. Uh, this is just an example of, you know, kind of what the... Um, what the book was about, and uh, 
some of the complexities that the artists of that time were dealing with, in fact. Uh, he also takes, you know, quite directly from references from Persian art, Islamic art. Um, you can see this is a, um, an image that references the Battle of Karbala. You see the veiled um, figure, the holy figure. And then we can go to the Mets. Um, so there's, a, you know, the Met being the Met, they have, we have such a wonderful, diverse range of materials that, can help contextualize the work, but how that happens in the gallery, I think, is a is a is an interesting question that I haven't fully answered myself. Um, the other source of inspiration, I think, what, for him were these coffee house pa paintings, as they were called, and this is another piece in the museum in the Met. Um, Mariam Echtiar is doing a wonderful job of collecting some amazing Qajar work, which is what he is, is looking at in many cases. And uh, he recalls seeing a show that Monier Farman Farmayan, also in the Met Collection, had organized in 1967 in Iran of these coffee house paintings and cites that as a, an important moment in his work. And so this is a piece titled War and Peace that I, I really love. And we're gonna maybe zoom in next slide. Or sorry, um, actually this, if you had, could we go back to the last slide? Okay, this figure in the corner is, I think, um, uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. I think I'll see his. Yes, thank you, Fat Ali Shah, thank you. Um, and you can see him here again. He's as in the Ardashir Mohasis um, drawing. He's holding his hookah, and in the Mohasis drawing, he's sort of over looking over his palace, and it's full of. Um, we can we can keep going forward. I have a detail shot of it. Um, well, there's another reference. These acrobatic um, dancers which are interesting to think of in terms of some of his upside down figures. But this, I love this work because you can look at it, you just sort of look at it and more and more <laughs> little vignettes pop out at you and each one is a self-contained um, story and they're really divided between different forms of decadence, the decadence of violence and the decadence of pleasure and it's the kind of war and peace um, that I think he was interested in. This is a, another very interesting work. Um, it's partly collaged, which I think uh, is something characteristic of his works from that period and why it's also so important to see these works in person because in reproduction, that kind of layering does not, um, is, is, is difficult to really see. So this piece is titled Central Park, which is written on the back. And that's how it's titled in the book Closed Circuit, which documents a lot of his work. And interestingly enough, in the very bottom, it says Park, and you'll have to uh, correct my pronunciation, Leila, um, Park Shahir, City Park? Park Park Shah. Park, Park Shah, which is, uh, I understand, a um, big park in the center of Tehran, built in 1953. Um, so he's sort of making this parallel between that park and Central Park, I guess, in New York. So he's in New York at the time. What was happening in this period in 1988 was that there was a massive massacre of thousands of political prisoners, especially leftist politi political prisoners. And so what you see here is almost that it's a very carnivalesque kind of atmosphere. <laughs> you have the, the gallows, and then you have the family. I think you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, you have this family up in the upper left corner getting their photo taken. You, know, you have some people playing music and seeming to dance. So it's the, again, it's almost like War and Peace. It's this combination of the coexistence of these two sort of <laughs> forms of existence. And having been in Cairo during the Arab Spring at the beginning, I can testify to the way in which these incredibly, incredibly vicious sort of protests and, and fighting in public 
would be happening. And then around the corner, there'd be somebody, you know, walking around selling co cotton candy. And it's, I think there is something surreal about how people engage with that violence when it's placed in the public sphere. Apparently the killings, okay, thank you. The killings were um, kept quiet and were actually took place inside prisons. So, and there was a big denial of this happening. So it's interesting that he chose to situate it in the central park. It's like the greatest point of visibility in the city. Um, but um, I wanted to end with this series, which is the largest series in, that we have of his. It's 129 individual sheets. Um, and it's, uh, the, it's his illustration of a 14th century um, Arab Iranian um, poet named Obed Zakani. Uh, Obeid Zakani, and he um, he 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 reminds me of Ardashir in, <laughs> in various ways, but this piece is known as the Rishnama, the Book of the Beard, or Hoganology, which is the study of the beard. And um, let me just read you one scholar's um, um, explanation of what this work is. So. She writes, the work entitled Rishnama, one of Abed's recognized masterpieces, is an undated mixed work in prose and verse, the subject of which is the critical moment in which facial hair replaces the soft down on a pubescent boy's cheeks. The central theme of the work is therefore a typical theme of the classic Persian lyric, the first appearance of the beard to spoil the beauty of the beloved youth. Obeid's intention in composing this work is to condemn the moral corruption of pederasty while recalling the theme and style of an obscene poem by Saadi. Um, and uh, the condemnation of this vice is carried out through the literary expedient of a satirical dispute in which a personified beard defends its own virtues in a lively debate with the poet himself. So the sense of humor, the sort of he was drawn to these moments of kind of obscene humor, um, but also very uh, a very interesting literature of um, the 14th century and this really incredibly interesting figure that he seems drawn to th through perhaps a shared interest in a critique of um, social relations, power relations, political relations. Um, and I would love to have somebody who, uh, who knows about Obeid Zekeni or a lot about Mohassas to come and take a look at this and help us understand what's going on here. Um, and we ha I have a couple other uh, examples there. So there's certainly some erotic scenes, but also, uh, a lot of humor um, in the next slide. You can see he's um, partially looking at things like Persian miniatures and composing these. So uh, I end by saying that um, I think it's the role of a museum um, like the Met, um, like many museums, to be able to be points of access for artists whose work um, would otherwise be uh, unavailable or available in parts. And I think that, that when it comes to non-Western artists, that is especially important, especially urgent, as you know, we lose people and things get lost. And um, it's, uh, it's something that needs to be done urgently and, and in order for this work not to be lost. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Claire. Um, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Adeshir Bobaknial, who um, is a major authority on his friend. Uh, Adeshir Moasses, he's an independent scholar, artist, philanthropist. Uh, he has been a, uh, a professor 
of um, Benderson at UCLA Irvine and Chapman and a patron of the arts and of Persian artists. Um, he is the founder of the Menorah Foundation uh, devoted to Holocaust awareness and co-author most recently with Dr. Ali Banu Azizi on the most recent monograph on Ardashir Mohasses, a retrospective published 2022, UCLA Press. So I will now invite Dr. Fawbak Mia, who will um, speak to us about Ardashir's works in color. Thank you. Um, a lot of people, especially in Iran, they know Ardashir as a cartoonist and graphic artist, which he draw things in black and white. Uh, we all know that he left Iran in mid-70s, and before that, he did a lot of black and white. However, in the last 30 years of his life, he have done lots of paintings and drawings in color. And uh, Sarajan, how do we change the, do I do it or you do it? Okay. Uh, he did uh, a couple hundred paintings most of them in color for uh, my books about the Holocaust. Uh, beyond this, which presentation, beyond this, I'm going to talk about a few works that he did in 1960s, which this is one of them. And then the next one is about, we call it Anjuman Bonavon in Iran. Uh, again, in uh, 1960s, which was published in Cactus. Then, when he went to Europe, first to Paris, then uh, immigrated to U.S., this is a part of the work that he did in, uh, in Paris. Uh, next one, same as this one, uh, Balance in the Circus, a beautiful painting. And this one, and uh, a lot of work that he did initially in uh, late seventies. Stop on this one, Sarah. Uh, in an early or mid eighties, had some religious theme in them. And this one, with uh, his uh, signature giggle and laugh, Nikki. He called it the last two people on earth, that they're fighting with each other and uh, with their uh, particular attire that I don't go in more detail about it. And he has uh, the one that shows the last one even. I think it's the probably next one that shows not in this one, another one. Then we will keep on this one. This is a beautiful one. He called it, uh, okay, as I said, a lot of uh, things that he did in mid 80s had some religious uh, theme in them. This is combination of uh, collage and his paintings. And most of these paintings are 18 by 14, watercolor, as you can see. Next one, Sarajan. Uh, he did a series of clown that I have it in my collection. Uh, then I put few of them, three or four of them in this one. Strangely enough, he calls this one secular clown, but those people who are uh, familiar with the religious things in Iran, they could see some religious emblem in this but for whatever reason, he called it the uh, secular clown. Another one of those uh, combination, collage and... Uh, 
detergent, just keep a little bit more, few more seconds for each one so we can all absorb it. Go back to the other one, please. We have time, so just keep about 30 seconds on each at least. He was doing part of these things while I guessed at my home and was seeing his, uh, she, uh, Nikki knows, Nikki Najumi, how he was giggling when he was doing this, how much he was enjoying and had in his mind what this was all about. Next. Yeah, this is what he called the last one on earth to show that they are peaceful. I don't go in much more detail. <laughs> There's two of these, I think. This is another one. This is part of the clown thing that he did. Please hold it on this one there. He called this people of his uh, fanatic clowns. again he called it fanatic we have time this again so we all enjoy this is part of the same series of fanatic clown This is one of the, I just put one sample of the, the Holocaust one to show the call. We're going to go in much more detail, which much more explanation about uh, the other ones that I had the blessing to discuss with him how to uh, approach and what to say about the paintings in much detail in mid 2000, 2006 and seven what was writing my Holocaust books. This is again part of the series of the clowns. This one he called it Defeated Clown. Beautiful paint. This is a large one. I think this is about 60 centimeter by 40 centimeter in size. This is a part of called the Persian clown. Yeah. Very delightful. This this series about half a dozen of and depiction of the Persian clowns. Few ones or happy ones uh, was more of a celebration. Is the next this one and hold it here and the next one it was a feast of the molas that he did in I think late eighties. Again these are probably eighty centimeter by about sixty centimeter. Beautiful, beautiful. There's two of these work. Next one, Sarita. The 
image at the bottom side according to him was one of his best work the one that has the thing in it and he called it copyrights and he called it one of his best work and he, he loved that one next this is an title one of the one he did in Paris in 1970s. This is Noru's celebration with what they call it Sazo Dohol. Beautiful. Mid 80s. Another one which is really enjoyable. Beautiful painting. And this is a cabaret. And those people who remember the right side, the violinist is Parvize Yoaki. And the dancer was Jamile. And he was having so much fun doing this. He loved to go to cabaret. And he has few of them in the smaller, but this is a large one. I think this is probably the last one, I think. Oh, this is Dr. Mossadegh. He did several Mossadegh. A few of them are in a very serious, very formal attire. This is Mossadegh in, in the court defending himself. And uh, thank you. little while but there we go thank you so much uh, to share for that wonderful overview of his works in color which is really an understudied subject and uh, revealed many new and fascinating works to us um, the second part of our panel is devoted to Adishimo Hasses in literature in books and um, I would just mention that uh, the artist passed away shortly opening of his uh, major retrospective at the Asia Museum uh, in New York. And, um, that catalog is one of the major contributions to um, the literature. Uh, our two speakers today are major figures, critical figures in the um, study of Mohatsas. Uh, they have both been personal friends um, as well as devoted researchers and uh, promoters of the work of this artist. Um, next, I will call on uh, Dr. Ali Banu Azizi, um, research professor at Boston College um, and a, a very preeminent scholar of Iranian modern history. Um, he was uh, also the author of one of the earliest studies on Mohasses, The Closed Circuit, in 1989, and continues to be active, and um, we're very pleased to welcome him from Boston via Zoom in our panel. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank professors um, Zami and um, Sarah Madandar and their colleagues and associates at Loyola University and this film and Blackwell Museum for organizing this magnificent conference and well-deserved um, tribute to um, Adishu Mahasis and for inviting me to uh, take part in it. Uh, what I hope to do in my presentation um, is something rather ambitious, which is to try to uh, contextualize and to, um, in a sense, divide up um, his work, um, his artwork into four um, successive periods. Uh, 
if you will, four phases um, in the development and evolution um, of his um, artwork. Um, needless to say, uh, this cannot be a very rigid um, periodization um, of his work. Um, I mean, there's a lot of back and forth um, in it. But as you will see, um, I think it does make some sense to um, think of at least four separate periods or succeeding successive um, periods, I should say, um, in the development and evolution um, of his um, um, art. Uh, the first phase uh, I would simply describe as his uh, early works um, when he was in Iran in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, the second phase is uh, uh, the period uh, that began with his um, um, invitation to go to Paris um, and uh, to um, work there for about uh, five or six months. Uh, the third phase uh, was his um, emigration to the United States, his coming to New York and uh, Shortly thereafter, within a couple of years, his encounter um, with the Islamic Revolution um, of 1979. And finally, uh, the, the last phase uh, uh, I would describe as his later works, roughly from the late 1980s to um, early uh, 2000s. Now, I should say that my comments on various aspects of uh, my sister's works are based on uh, the different accounts of his life and works by um, various other um, scholars, um, very uh, notably, uh, Mr. Niki Nojumi, the great uh, artist in his own rights, uh, but also on the basis of my own uh, over three decades um, of um, friendship um, in, um, in, uh, in the last uh, 30 years of, um, of his life. Um, during this period, I saw him occasionally, uh, but I corresponded with him, uh, you know, very profusely. And uh, just to give you um, a, a taste, a sense of uh, the manner in which he wrote letters, um, I thought I would uh, share with you uh, a couple of his letters uh, so that you would see that even his uh, letter writing uh, was a work of art. Um, I hope I'm uh, sharing screen. Just one second, please. Uh, okay. Um, I wonder if you can see um, a portrait of uh, uh, Moises at this time. Uh, so uh, the letters that I wanted to show you, just one second. Uh, here is an example um, of, um, of one of his letters. Uh, to me, I've kept oh, quite a few of them. Um, here's another example. Uh, and in each letter, uh, he would include some, uh, some drawings and uh, uh, from time to time, uh, some color. Um, and, um, and they were really something for me to uh, uh, behold. So let me then begin uh, my uh, uh, description of the four phases um, of, uh, of his life and um, the work of art. Uh, the first phase, his um, early works, um, roughly uh, in the uh, period uh, from uh, uh, early 1950s um, to, uh, uh, and, and I think for the most part, um, during the 1960s as well. Um, as you know, he was born in, um, in Rasht, 
uh, in a provision, provincial city, northern uh, Iran, um, into a very prosperous, enlightened, um, and artistic family. He lost his father as a judge um, in, um, in infancy and was raised by his mother, uh, Ms. Sorur Mahkam Mahasis, uh, who was a poet um, and an educator herself. As he put it um, years later, it was her creativity and endless supply of funny stories, um, which he, she invented mostly on the spare of the moment for her children um, that helped to shape uh, my talent. Uh, my sis began uh, to draw quite early um, in his life. Uh, when he was three years old, the story goes, um, during World War II and the occupation of Iran by the Allied powers, he was taken to a film uh, with the title something like Enemies of the Nazis. When he returned home, he was asked what the movie had been all about. Uh, rather than describing verbally what he had seen, he began to draw some of the scenes from the film that had impressed him the most. As he recalled um, years later, since that time, it has been much easier for me to express my thoughts and feelings through my drawings uh, than in any other form. Um, he never studied art formally. Upon completing secondary school, he took the highly competitive entrance examination at the Faculty of Fine Arts at Tehran University. And although he had placed uh, in the top position in fine arts, in the fine arts exam, the so-called concours, um, he chose to enroll in the Faculty of Law, um, hoping perhaps to follow his father's footsteps. Well, Sis's first cartoon drawings were published as early as 1951, when he was still in high school in Tofik, uh, a very popular um, satirical journal, uh, which he continued uh, an on-off relationship with for the next um, eight years. Now, going to some of my... Uh, So here we have some examples um, of his drawings. Uh, this one, for example, uh, goes back to the 1940s, one of the very first of his um, drawings. Uh, we have another one um, in the late 1950s. As I mentioned, he really began publishing his works in the early 1950s. Uh, and we have another one, uh, again, late 1950s, uh, bureaucracy. Uh, what this shows is uh, uh, one of the clients pictured at the very top, um, who, whose case is passed around uh, from one bureaucrat um, to another. Um, another one, uh, Interestingly, in 1959, uh, he is describing uh, the extent of pollution um, in Tehran at the time. Uh, this was the time that diesel fuel was very uh, common um, in Tehran. And, uh, and I myself remember uh, the degree of pollution that existed um, at that time. Uh, here's another uh, pretty ordinary uh, subject, uh, a tailor, um, a woman, um, uh, you know, sewing uh, a piece of um, cloth uh, in 1963. Um, another one um, in the 1960s, wartime restaurant, the suicide miniature style. 1963. This is interesting. Uh, uh, the, the book that the young man is pushing into his head 
um, is labeled as chemistry, uh, you know, a way of uh, learning, uh, perhaps just before the exam, um, all about chemistry. And then uh, this was the time in which in Tehran, um, in the early 1960s, um, uh, you know, uh, taking fruit juices was very um, popular. Um, and uh, here, uh, this young man is, um, is putting his diploma um, and, and, in a sense, juicing it to, uh, to, uh, to draw some benefit um, from it. Um, and then um, a couple of um, uh, drawings of uh, one of a woman, the other one of a man. Uh, and during this entire period, his minimalist line drawings, which distorted recognized forms and shapes, his macabre and surrealistic images um, that revealed human pettiness, greed, mendacity, arrogance, and sexual perversion. Uh, these were basically the themes of most of his drawings during this um, um, early uh, period. By masterfully dissecting his subjects from the highest to the lowest stations in life, he exposed their foibles, flaws, and hypocrisies. His erotically charged drawings, as he put it to me some years later, I must say that fortunately the personages in my works are always blessed with a great deal of sex. These were often based on old Persian and Indian erotic art presented in convoluted and at times liberating images of human um, sexuality. Mohassis's reputation as an avant-garde Iranian caricaturist grew rapidly in the late 1960s and early 1970s. He oversaw the publication of 11 of his collections of drawings in Iran, which were often introduced by prominent literary figures, journalists, and art critics, and numerous solo and group exhibitions of his work were held in Tehran galleries. This pretty much brings me to the end of the first phase in his um, uh, works. This one is an incomplete justice, uh, pretty much the last in this period of his work, done in 1970. Now we go to the next um, period um, of, his, um, uh, of his artistic work. And during this period, an important event was uh, for him to travel to France to begin a period of collaboration with the weekly magazine uh, Jeune Afrique for over six months, um, as I mentioned. Now, outside from bolstering his international reputation as a leading graphic artist, his sojourn in Paris opened the world of color um, for him. Until that time, almost all of Mahasis's works had been black and white line drawings or heavily cross-hatched in black ink. Reflecting on this stylistic shift in his works, he himself said, and here I'm um, quoting from him, for a long time, I did not use color. Perhaps this was due to the fact that my immediate environment and the city in which I lived, Tehran, um, were not particularly colorful. When I first went to Paris, I fell in love with the enthralling beauty and colorfulness of the city. The entire setting of buildings and people's faces were multicolored and seemed to have been painted in harmony together. You could see the four seasons in one day. This made me notice color 
and open new vistas for me. Since then, I've used color whenever I thought of the occasion demanded, mostly um, with crayons, pastels, or watercolors. So let me then show you a few uh, paintings from this period, uh, beginning in the early 1970s. Zekan, 1973, a beautiful painting, which by the way is on the cover of our book uh, from 1973. Two um, women, an entitled gain from the early 70s. Man in Prayer, Solzhenitsyn, obviously not all of his drawings and paintings during this period were in color, uh, including this one in the, again in the 1970s. And Islamic militants gain in black and white power. Now, again, um, still focusing on this second um, period, the period that began with his uh, sojourn in Paris, uh, this decade of 70s was also a period in which Moises became more closely acquainted with the works of such leading Western artists as Bosch, uh, Bruegel, Goya, Daumier, Picasso, as well as the British cartoonist Ronald Serly, the French artist Jean Th Thomas Ungerer, uh, and the American cartoonist um, Saul Steinberg. In his interview with the notable Iranian poet and philosopher um, Ismail Khoi in the late 1970s, Mohassis talked about the influence of these um, great artists. He said, of course, I knew these artists before, but I can say that it was in this period, meaning in the 1970s, that these works deeply influenced me. That is, I really got them. That is, I internalized them and digested them. Then, uh, as I mentioned, we see the influence of this exposure to Western art uh, in a much clearer way. In, and then um, also, as I mentioned, the use of color, which in my judgment, pretty much characterized this second phase in the development of his um, artwork. Now, the third phase um, is basically, um, you know, a period that is marked not so much by a new style, but by his um, emigration um, to the United States um, and uh, uh, his encounter um, with the um, Islamic Revolution of 1978-79. So let me come to that period. And here, uh, let me say a few words about how he wound up um, in the United States. Um, his rising uh, popularity uh, in the early 1970s as an independent minded and critical artist uh, brought him uh, under the scrutiny of uh, the Iranian um, secret police organization, the so-called um, SAVAK. The deliberate political ambiguities in his published works were taken as thinly disguised criticisms of the Pahlavi regime and its high officials, while his dismembered 
deformed, mutilated figures were seen as suggestive of the torture suffered by political prisoners at the time in Iran. He was warned that his works would be banned if he were to persist in such fantasies of horror. Um, on other occasions, he was asked to provide more descriptive uh, uh, captions for his drawings before they appeared in print in order to prevent people from misinterpreting the content of his works. He took these warnings seriously enough to decide to leave Iran in 1976 to, for a freer life, at least temporarily at that time in his mind um, in the United States. Now, less than two years after he arrived um, in New York, that is after two years after 1976, Moises witnessed from afar the unfolding of the 1978-79 um, Iranian revolution. Like other Iranian artists and intellectuals, he initially welcomed the coming of the revolution, but soon thereafter, he found that the new regime was far more repressive, both politically and culturally, than the one that um, had replaced, that it had replaced. And he resigned himself at this time to the fact that his American sojourn um, had become a prolonged, if not a permanent life in exile. So let me then go to some of his um, drawings from this period, which, as I mentioned, um, uh, depict the various um, phases, uh, the various aspects um, of the Iranian revolution. And, uh, here is, for example, one of the very famous scenes. Um, I'm very sorry for this thing that is appearing at the very top um, of this. Um, I, I, Beg your pardon. Well, let me not take too much time. So this is yet another scene from the revolution. This is a very famous scene from the revolution, the bloody demonstrations in, uh, in Shiraz in 1978. That is the final, in the final months of the Iranian um, revolution. Yet another scene uh, labeled today's martyrs demonstrate in honor of tomorrow's martyrs. Again, in 1978, during those final months and weeks of the revolution. Revolutionary patience. woman carrying a flower, the same woman carrying the booties, sorry, from the Nyavaran, the Shah's uh, palace. The revolution of the barefooted. Let me say that during the tumultuous events of the revolution and its aftermath from late 1970s to early 1980s, these became really the focus of um, his attention um, during this um, period. And the drawings are extraordinarily um, powerful. Uh, but what is also um, interesting um, during this period is that he, he got it. He realized that the revolution on which he and most other intellectuals, most other Iranian people had pinned their hopes for a more democratic uh, and open society uh, was indeed turning um, a oppressive uh, regime. And here, then, he began to 
present some of the participants um, in the revolutionary movements, the downtrodden revolutionaries, uh, not always as innocent victims of the revolution, but really showing that their hands, that is the hands of the victims, were now solid. And the ugliness and the inhumanity that they had so often exposed in their oppressors could be seen in the victims' own faces and bodies. In one such drawing, a wretched group of men carrying the dismembered corpse of a fallen prince, have their heads literally penetrating the prince's amputated body and they are, that they are carrying. Let me show you that drawing, which is really one of my um, uh, favorites. You see how the people who are carrying the prince's body, they themselves are very much caught in this ugly, ugly um, scene. Their heads really um, inside the cut up body of the prince. And then various other uh, drawings from this period, focusing on the king, Um, the new and the old minister, members of the new cabinet. You could see that members of the old cabinet are all being hanged. The Shah and his cabinet. So this was the period, the third period in uh, Mohasis's um, uh, life. Now we come to the final period, the fourth period, during which he really develops a, a rather different style um, of painting. And let me elaborate on that um, a little bit. Here's one untitled drawings. You see that the drawings are becoming more abstract, colorful, and the style is beginning to change during this period. And just to give you some um, background here, let me mention that, as was mentioned in one of the previous um, presentations, a number of Maasis's um, works from the years of the revolution were acquired by the Library of Congress to be housed in the library's permanent collection. As described very perceptively by the head of the curatorial um, section of the library, uh, Mr. Bernard O'Reilly, in the introduction that he wrote um, to a book that was based on this exhibit, I'd like to read, it's a longish quotation from uh, Mr. Riley, but I think it's a very perceptive one that characterizes the style in which Mises did his satire. Mr. Riley says, the drawings in life in Iran, which is the title of the book that he published, have a grandeur of scale, a sobriety of tone, and a realism which marked the series as an undertaking of a higher and more serious order. The drawings have few, if any, counterparts in the world of political cartoons. The latter is highly conventionalized idiom, employing limited vocabulary of symbols and capable of little subtlety. Cartoons tend to be historically specific firmly situation, situated in their particular time and place. Ardeshir, for the most part, rejects the symbols and conventions of that idiom. The drawings in the life in Iran, moreover, avoid typicality and possess even an international ambiguity, while the atrocities which inspired these drawings were indeed real 
they are never portrayed with any specificity. I think this is a really a wonderful and a very perceptive characterization of Marcus's um, drawings during um, this period. Now, uh, in this last period of um, his um, life, um, if you will, from the late 1980s to the year 2000, in spite of living alone, often in poor health and financially uh, strained, these last two decades of his life turned out to be extraordinarily productive. A positive development was his successful laser eye surgery in the early 1980s, which corrected the poor vision from which he had suffered since early childhood. As he put it very gleefully, before I saw through a peephole, now I see through a telescope, he told me. This new clarity of vision opened wide vistas of shapes and colors for him that influenced his later works during this um, period. Unhappily, the onset of his Parkinson's disease, which was diagnosed in 1986, took a progressively heavy toll on his ability to draw, yet rather than giving up, Marcis responded to the challenge of the new illness by embarking on new styles of work. And as his close associate an artist, Mr. Niki Nojumi, has pointed out, these included using assemblages or collages by putting together different elements of his past drawings, new newspapers, cut cutouts, photocopies of various images enhanced by water watercolor, and as well as various other uh, highly innovative and new styles of um, drawings which I began to show you a few of them. Let me show a few more. These are all from the 1980s. Ali John, I think we need to start wrapping yes, up. Yes, yes, I will finish just in one minute, finishing this part. So let me end, if I may, by saying that Ardashir's more than three decades of life in exile never diminished his love for his native land and his sense of cultural identity with it. Though he never tried deliberately to give his work local color, much of his artwork was inspired by Iran's literary traditions, history, popular culture, and the prevailing political realities. His piercing vision, his creative genius, and his artistic mastery enabled him to go beyond the confines of, one, of any one cultural tradition or artistic style, and indeed beyond all deceptive appearances and conventional views in his search for deeper meanings and truths. I apologize for going on a bit too long, and, and I will end it here um, with my thanks for your uh, listening in. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I've just mentioned that we will take questions after the last presentations from the audience. But now I will invite uh, Dr. Babak Mia uh, to speak to us about uh, Deshir's works on the Holocaust. Thank you, Dr. Diva. Thank you, Dr. Mazami. Thank you, Sarah, Madame Dar. And it's an honor to be on the same panel with Ms. Claire, Dr. Claire Davis. And in the presence of Nikki Njumi and distinguished others, uh, Moises, as I said, was my, I was honored to have him as a guest in my house for a few months. 
And it was while I was writing my books about the Holocaust, and uh, which they ended up to be four volumes. And when he was leaving, he uh, told me that he's going to draw some paintings about the Holocaust, some drawings. I thought just going to do two, three, four for my cover of my books. But between 1987 and 1889, for the two years, he did about a couple hundred images about the Holocaust. We can draw the collage of them. And uh, I placed part of these in my book. We call it the Humanity in Not, which is about emotions and ethics of the Holocaust or lack thereof, emotions and ethics. And I was blessed and privileged to discuss these images with him. And uh, we're gonna see a few images uh, every 10, 15 seconds. But then after those, I go and discuss in detail about dozen images in couple minutes in each minutes to discuss. This is about the survivor. Next. This is uh, the title was Why. Why. This is consumed by death. Shows a Nazi officer who is really consumed. His soul and body was consumed by death. Next. Uh, this is, uh, he called it the Holocaust. But if you look in the middle, you'll see image of Hitler, that blood coming from his mouth. And uh, amazing, amazing image. Next. This is again screaming why. And we'll discuss later on what we put about the why. Next. This is cruelty. This uh, was uh, at Auschwitz. The purpose of living was dying. Next. <coughs> this was uh, being alone. Being alone in the world. This was indifference, walking away from the cause about bystanders. This was about uh, the cruelty and evilness of the Holocaust. Next. I'm going to discuss this one when we go to the. Uh, this is again kicking them out. Next. I'm going to discuss this in more detail. This is an amazing painting. Go to the details of it. As I said, I put about over 150 of these images in the book. We call it Humanity Not, which has been translated in a couple languages, Farsi, Arabic, Turkish, and we are working on the German and Hebrew. Next. This was done in collaboration with Ardashir. Together we did it. Not only the painting, but also the uh, explanation of what to put, how to interpretation of the paintings. Next. This is Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Laureate Holocaust survivor in 2012. The preprint of book when he was looking at it and he wrote something for the book. While he was looking at it, he said, this is the most vivid images that I've seen about the Holocaust. And then he turned to his wife, says, Marion, did you realize what I just said? I used the word vivid and the Holocaust in the same sentence. It says, oh my God, oh my God. So he was very touched by this. And he said, these lessons of these images are, makes us sensitized to humanity, other people, humanity. Next. 
This is our last book that uh, Dr. Diva did, uh, talked about, which I did with, I was honored to do it with Dr. Banu Azizi. It's a retrospective about the work of the Holocaust, 50 years of his work from childhood to the end of life. And I have to thank Nikki Nujumi for being so uh, gra gracious in helping us in many aspects of the book. Yeah, we go here and talk about uh, explanation about things that I discuss with uh, the with Ardesh here. Uh, we were always wondering that how could somebody kill someone with no remorse, with no with not feeling any bad, and worse than that, you make other people kill for you for your cause. Sim it's so simple that really scares you. What it is is process of dehumanization. You consider the victim not being worthy of living, not being a human. So you are not human because if you kill a human, you feel guilty. You are not even animal because you feel animal, you feel guilty. You are a Jew. Now you are a Shia. Now you are a whatever you are. In the in Russia, you're from wherever Ukraine, so you can kill without any remorse. Next one, as I said, this is what they call the process of dehumanization. Dehumanize your victim. So when you kill them, you feel good because you're cleaning, you're cleansing. It's just like when you kill, uh, you spray for cockroaches, for mouse, you don't even feel bad, you feel good because you're cleaning your, your house. Next. A German young, student uh, was uh, 21 years old. He called them, the German Jews at the time, we no longer are human. We are a strange psychophysical product made in Germany. So we have to be wasted. If you get rid of us, the psychophysical waste would be good for you. Next. And these people were getting to be in the camps so filthy, they were really getting dying in their own excrement. So even themselves, even the victims were hating themselves, let alone the perpetrator. So when you kill him, you're getting rid of a, this filthy guy who is dying in his excrement. Next. So this is an amazing photo, which I think is really haunting photo. This is a 25 years old young woman who was at Auschwitz. And he, she said, I realized this filthy situation that they put us in is a purposeful, willing, they doing it with a purpose to dehumanize us. So she says, if I die in Auschwitz, I will die as a human being. You cannot dehumanize me. Next photo, so they said I'm gonna explain it. This photo I had really long conversation with Adashir and even one of my secretary who were helping me typing the books. How could the victim to be bigger than the Nazis? This is the same thing. You cannot dehumanize me. It says, oh my God, I have no clothes, I have no name even. I'm titled right now 35282. I have no books, I have no family, but I'm still bigger than you are because you cannot take away my soul. Next. So what is my fascination as a physician, as a fertility special, as a university medical school professor with this, why do I write? I've helped creating 3,000 mothers or helping fertility 3,000 babies to come to war. So babies are very precious to me. They're the future of humanity. My point is why are you, did you kill one million innocent children who even did not know they are what their religious is? So next one. This is a picture of uh, Leila, my fertility babies. These are my, every year I was celebrating Mother's Day. So for me, these precious things are the future of humanity. And when, next one, it's, they say that 
This is an amazing story because in the book I'm telling and the story, some of the story, each pages of a story, there's no uh, drawing by Ardashir, I put a photo. This is an amazing, people who are mother, they understand and they, this goes to the soul of humanity or inhumanity. One day, one of Nazi's uh, officer write in his diary that in two days we took away 20,000 children from the Lodge, Yero to Auschwitz. Said the mothers, they were tearing their skin, their hair, their clothes. They were screaming for their babies. And there was one mother who screamed so loud that it silenced every other scream. So Nazi officers, go get your child. So she goes to the wagon to get the child. Three children says, mommy, mommy, save me. The officer says, uh-uh. Choose one, only one you can take out. So she came out empty handed. Next, what is behind this? Why this significant? It says in history, no killer can kill a child before he can kill the child within him. But during the Holocaust, it was different. They killed one million children with no remorse. Next. These are the amazing drawing by Ardashir about kids, victims of the Holocaust. Next. Elie Wiesel has a beautiful statement, really profound, it's made a random beautiful. It says you cannot kill one million children and believe that the world can go on as it did before. If we don't pay attention to this, humanity is gonna pay for it. Next. And we discuss what were the crime. The crimes was just their existence. The crime was just, just to be different. They call it in Farsi, they get Andish. They, in English they call it others because they were others. Next. That's why I have coined the uh, phrase, this was really a genetic terrorism. They were killed just because of their genes, not because of what they did. Next. This is an amazing, I will finish in about five minutes. This is an amazing photo was, uh, <coughs> it is in Copenhagen uh, Museum or Amsterdam Museum that on one Christmas evening, Christmas Eve 1942, these are all Nazi officers celebrating Christmas. But Nazis killed anybody who was born from a Jewish mother, even if he was Christian, even Jewish grandparents. So this says if Jesus Christ was alive during the Holocaust, he would have been sent to Auschwitz. So this shows the profoundness of this senseless of these killings. Next, this is an amazing thing that Ardashir did, says it's the Nazis did what was beyond imagination of evil. They gave a new definition of what evil is all about. Next. However, I believe that Holocaust, and this picture showed, does not belong to the Jews. It's a crime against humanity. Next. So to me, these pictures or these paintings, what the, and the essence of the book is that Holocaust is really in, is not a Jewish tragedy. It's a, hu it's a death of human morality, failure of this uh, civilization, is an unsolved puzzle in which the victim have no rights but the right to die. So it was assault of the Nazis and humanity and not such assault of Nazis really on goodness itself. Next. Again, my fascination or my thing with this story is the story of the children.
next, then that would be, I think, the final thing. Is, and despite all these, I believe in the beautifulness and goodness of humanity, and I believe that eventually goodness would prevail. That's it. Thank you so much for this discussion and presentation of uh, Adeshir's and yours collaboration and the gift you gave to, to Adeshir of his last great subject toward the end of his life. So we have a, a few minutes for um, questions from the audience. Uh, I think all our speakers would be happy to answer any questions or comments you might have. Sara, would you have anything you would like to comment on? I have a question from all of you. Particularly, Professor Balazizi. <coughs> Can you hear me? Okay. I do have a question from all of you, particularly Professor Balazizi, and that is: uh, Do you think Mohassas in the 60s could be considered as uh, someone who was uh, non-typical with other scholars? with other intellectuals. I mean, we do have him, uh, Shamlu, and Khanoum uh, Farokhzad as the three big names at that, of the period. But they were somehow rebellious. Would you, would you, th would you think it's correct or not? We can't hear you, Doctor. Doctor John, we can't hear you. Yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that I understand the question. You were comparing, uh, or you would like me to compare, uh, Mohassis with some of the other artists of his time. Is that the question? My question is: Mohassis in sixties. I believe Mohassis in sixties was different from other, all other uh, artists and intellectuals. He, I mean, he was with Shamlu and Farrokhzad, the three big head of the Iranian intellectuals movement. Yes. Am I correct or not? Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, I don't think that he had any involvement, if you will, in those intellectual movements. Um, for example, uh, you know, we looked at some of his drawings on the so-called Vestoxification, Garb Zadegi. He never joined those debates. He was not a political activist in any sense of the term, but of course his drawings um, were deeply political, uh, but he never entered, if you will, into politics. He uh, uh, he was not interested in doing that. Uh, um, in that sense, he he isolated himself um, throughout um, this period and focused exclusively um, on his art. That's my take uh, on him. But his art wasn't his language. Wasn't his art a way to express his? Uh, frustration with the moment? Absolutely, absolutely. But what I was saying is that he did all of that. He expressed his politics. He gave voice to his political views, um, you know, through his drawings, you know, through his art, but not through any kind of, you know, uh, association or uh, making uh, political statements or joining any groups uh, or political party or, or anything of that sort. In that sense, he was, you know, publicly, if you will, demonstratively apolitical. Uh, but artistically, of course, he was very political. 
and uh, and that was probably the greatest contribution that you could make um, to uh, uh, to politics and to resistance to uh, repression. Thank you. Um, so my question is directed at all three of you. Daisy spoke about it the most with the difficulties of bringing an Eastern artist into the Western world. Um, do y'all believe that there is sort of that prevents some understanding specifically Iranian through artist year if cultural phenomenon folklore isn't really grounded in Western understanding and is more of that Eastern mindedness, those home stories and cultures that a person like myself could never really understand. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's, for me, this is the big challenge of this moment in which museums around the world are sort of acknowledging for the first time in a real sense that there, you know, there has been, there have been artists working um, everywhere for the past hundred years, and that you know, I I think for me it's I want to avoid I I want I, I want to make sure that every work that goes on view retains its specificity, you know, and and that you know he's obviously looking at a specific kind of visual heritage, but he also I also don't want to. You must avoid ghettoizing, you know, um, these artists, or um, uh, sort of, you know, framing them in a way that other, you know, general audiences wouldn't feel comfortable. Are there is a way into every work of art? I think, no matter how specific it is to the moment, and it's a matter of of how to do that and what context to present it in. Um, which is why I think, you know, if ideally he would be presented in the context of the, the many multiple references he had, he was, you know, extremely well educated in art history. And I think um, that would be part of it. So including examples from the US, from he, he, you know, he was involved in all these different moments and periods of time and places and, um, and also, uh, uh, sometimes I think the work can just st stand alone as a, you know, s maybe a exhibition on its own and you are sort of allowed to see how the artists themselves developed. And, um, uh, but, but this is the, the big question that I think a lot of curators at museums are struggling with. Um, the other pitfall I think that we've seen happen, unfortunately, is work shown in a way that um, sort of connotes a kind of that there that there's something derivative about it, which I think is um, just a kind of hangover from sort of unfortunate histories. But um, rather, these artists were in active communication, engaging. You know, sort of they they have an agency in the the way that they're interpreting other you know art art from other places and and um, critically engaging it. Um, so these are some of the issues I think that come up in, in that context. I'd like to add, um, it, it's a very complex question and we've been dealing with it, I think actually not actively since the 1960s and the episodes of the Biennales that started bringing artists together globally, but more or less in the last 10 decades, I think since um, uh, post-colonial studies. And there's been a great deal of progress, I think, in understanding um, the, the question of translation. I think that's a, that's a one concept to use, is, is the difficulty of translation. And we see that particularly in the figurative artists. Okay, it's, it's easier to take a Monia Farman Farmayan and to show her at the Guggenheim because she, she works in an abstract idiom that you can easily place within the current of Western art history. 
but um, there are other artists that are more difficult to interpret and, and to place within the continuum. And I, I found it very useful to compare um, Iranian post-war art with South American post-war art, um, the way it's been studied, the way it's been presented. And I, th I thought, again, that, uh, that one of the steps forward was the recent show at the Met on surrealism, which brought together global examples of surrealism, which was really, really innovative. But it was also very challenging to the art establishment who were not happy with you know, examples of surrealism from Egypt or North Africa. And again, all these um, uh, questions about value and quality. And uh, as you said, uh, who was there first? And uh, this question of being derivative. So there, there are a whole series of, of issues and questions, but they're being addressed, I think, increasingly. And I think the quality of uh, curating and scholarship has improved tremendously in outside of the West, whether you're talking about India or uh, the Arab world or Iran. And with, with the emergence of local museums, such as the Qatar Museum of Modern Art um, or the Sharjah Biennale, you know, um, I think all of these are, are leading to greater understanding. Um, but um, there are simply practical issues that need to be surmounted, such as, um, you know, where, how, do you, how do you access the art? How do you purchase the art? How do you interpret the art? So I do think that, that um, it, it progress is being made every day, and when we have more and more um, young curators who can bridge the East and the West, that's, that's what we need, and we need them to be within, they need them, we need them to be our more in, within the institutions. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. We do have a, a maybe last question from uh, Dr. Diba Abad. I'm just so curious to know how to, how you personally get to know Mohassas in Iran and how that happened, how, 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 to, uh, how you get to know Mohasses in Iran, and... I, I didn't meet mm -hmm. until I was in the States, and that was in about 2000, I don't know, around, uh, well, the first decade, uh, two th before 2008, and it was really only, I think, once that, that I, I went to his studio, but it was a very, very moving. Um, but people found Mohasses. He had so many friends, and he was open, and some of them are here with us uh, tonight. And uh, so I did not him in, in Iran, no. I was even in Iran. Thank you so much. Is there any other questions? No? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. <laughs> <laughs>